Biggie, I got a question for you, brother. All right, give it to me. How big are your hands? My it hands. doesn't matter how big your hands are. This is the We Don't Know Sports Podcast. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome, welcome back once again to the We Don't Know Sports Podcast. This is Chad the Mark with Mr. Brown and Big A. And we are back together again. Feels feels like it's been forever. Actually, you know, somebody's been sick or had their tooth pulled or something. So, you know, this has been a, a few weeks building up to it. But anyway, we got a lot to talk about. But, you know, we have a uh, interview coming up later in the show. The NFL Combine kicked off tonight. And, Biggie, you said somebody was fast as hell. I don't know. What was that that popped up a minute ago? Uh, Tayshawn. I can't remember the last name. Baylor wide receiver ran a 4 40 Not a confirmed official time. If it becomes a confirmed official 4 one it'd be the fastest 40 in Combine history. Damn. What's your 40 time? I run the 40 in about uh, 24.8 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh and for, that's not exaggerations that's just the way it is uh how about uh you mr brown when's the last time you've clocked yourself at a 40 uh, i haven't in the last two decades I, I, are you at least sub six i feel like i'm sub six i, I couldn't tell you <laughs> I, I feel like i was in the fours back when i was in, back in the day right when i was 18 before you had a broken freaking neck when i was the canal valley stolen base champion Ooh, little Ta- taekwon thornton Baylor wide receiver. Okay, so we'll see if it see if it stands uh, on its own merit there. So anyway, what I was telling you, Biggie, is we got uh, Marcus Ogden uh, joined me for a little bit of an interview. He was in between a couple things, but I snagged him for about fifteen minutes, and uh, you know, it was a fun conversation for the brief time. Hopefully, we'll reconnect. But you know, always fun to ask people uh, how their experience was when it goes through the combine and things like that. Uh, I look forward to listening to that. It'd be nice to see what his. Uh take is on different things within the league and then of course like you said as his brother's more well known but uh within the family it'd be nice to know yeah he's got a um interesting story because you know he, he had some pretty good success after football but then it kind of fell apart but then he picked himself back up and now he uh don't call him a motivational speaker he's an inspirational speaker there's a difference because motivational speakers are temporary uh, anyway. what do you think he runs a 40 in i asked him so you'll just have to tune in and find out. <laughs> I, I, I have a uh, a little challenge for you, Chad. Whenever uh, Rich Eisen does his run, Rich, run 40 yep. at the Combine here, we're going to see what the time is, and I'm going to go out. We're going to find a football field. I'm going to clock you, and you're going to run it faster than Rich. I, I I don't know if I can run it faster than Rich, even with all the, uh, the gear on he's got, but I, I would be curious just to see how bad my 40 time is. I don't know, man. You're like a thin rail. You turn sideways. I don't see. I'm betting. Ah, down, this, the speed doesn't increase, though. I, I tell you what, though, we've talked about before for like fantasy football draft purposes is like maybe that's how we consider the draft order is we all just run our 40 times. So Beaver's going to be last every year. <laughs> I was just saying, me and Beaver are picking 11 and 12. <laughs> no, but here's the thing you can all run it at the same time. So, you know, you can trip and push and things like that. This Ooh. sounds like somebody's going to the hospital. <laughs> Or maybe we can just do a slip and slide and see who goes farthest. Well, then it'll be me and Beaver at the first pick. <laughs> All right, off the rails. So uh, one big NFL news that came out was uh, they made an announcement when it came to their protocols around COVID today. So they are, I believe, the first sport that just said – they're we're, completely done. We're done. It. And I think some of that was wasn't the agents kind of like locking out, so to speak, for the combine. They kind of put some pressure on them and they caved. They had 150 players that were invited to the combine that got together as a group with their agents and said, we're not going to attend if we can't walk outside and go a couple blocks away from the facility without the restrictions in place. So they eased all that. And then day after uh, kind of – State of the Union, all that, where it seemed like it became okay. Well, we were talking it, about they did away with it. Our, the NFL completely did away with our own, um, our main hustles, not our side hustle. You know, I talked about how one day they said we didn't have to wear masks at work, and the next day Mr. Brown didn't have to wear a mask. So, I mean, you know, it's been two years, damn it. I, I'm ready for uh, life to get back to normal. Yeah, they just followed suit with what uh, you guys did. It was a week later. I mean, within within the last week, almost every major organization has went away with their COVID protocols. Yeah, I did see except the NBA. I did see the WHO was really concerned about a rise in COVID in Ukraine because you know that's the the biggest worry over there right now. 
Well, <laughs> <laughs> we're not? into COVID. <laughs> All right. So the uh, NFL Combine, how long does it go? And you know when it ends? Is it? Uh, it goes to Sunday. goes to Sunday. So. Or no, it goes through Sunday. I believe it goes for six days. Each, uh, they have like two, two uh, groups a day, you know. Offensive, defensive lineman, that type of thing. So we we talked last night about if we think a quarterback will get drafted in the top ten, and I say no, but there's always a team that reaches. And Turbo Tommy's missing out uh, today, but he's a big Steelers fan, and one of the things that he was kind of prognosticating is that they're going to go get Kenny Pickett from Pitt, and uh, Kenny Pickett apparently has very tiny hands. Very tiny hands. Eight and a half inches. Do you want to know the last player drafted with hands as small as his? Uh, it, Russell Wilson. Wait, no, 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 no. It was a year uh, ago. Yeah. Oh, I feel like I heard this today. Damn you it. must have heard this today. Guy was a stud. Um, I bet who it is. I Drew Brees. No, nope. no. Um, damn it. Played for Virginia Tech. No, he's got the largest hands ever. The Michael guy from Vick. Michael Vick. It, yeah. Oh, so check us out. The the guy who had the largest hands ever measured at the combine was Jim Drunkenmiller. Yes. You remember him? Yes, I do. Is he in the Hall of Fame? No. <laughs> you know, you want to know who else? Hands. We, we, you want to know who else had uh, huge hands? The Sanchez. What did he do? He ran into the butt of an offensive lineman and fumbled. That's why this whole thing is so overblown. If Pickett doesn't pan out, they're going to say it's because he had small hands. How big was Jamarcus Russell's hands? <laughs> I don't think it mattered. Yeah, <laughs> enough exactly. to hold that purple drink. <laughs> the, uh, the the whole thing is it's only a deal because remember people talking about Burrow and his hands, but Kenny Pickett's would be the smallest in the NFL, so that's why it's a big deal. So if he sucks, it'd be like, well, it's because he had small hands. He just well, he can wear gloves. Never had the makings of a varsity athlete, Biggie. Yeah, I tell you what, Teddy Two Gloves. He's in the NFL for like eight years now. I think Pickett will be okay. Uh, I, I, well, you know, a cold weather team can't draft him. You I know. guess. Why? Well, well, Miami gloves. can't draft him either. It rains. He can only go to play for a dome team, <laughs> Southern <laughs> California. You can still wear the gloves. It'll be okay. But so it's it's bigger deal than it should be. Mm, much bigger. The only there's only like a couple things at the combine that I ever really care about, and it's like uh, the three cone for players. Your ability to move back and forth quickly. But they look at quarterbacks and they throw, and this is why they all do their pro day now. You're going out there throwing to a bunch of guys you've never thrown to before. There's a reason they look better at the pro day. They have a ton of chemistry with those guys. I don't put a whole lot of stock into the draft combine because guys train for the combine. They leave college early. Their team sucks. They start, they leave school. They train for the combine. They go to the combine. They put up great numbers. They're a freak. They get drafted. They can't play football. Well, that's like there's some people that aren't running the 40 because they've hurt themselves leading up to it. That's why I, well, I was going to ask, is there any big name uh, athletes coming out of college that did not attend the combine because they didn't want to hurt their draft stock? I mean, there always are. I don't I have mean, this year. I don't have the, I don't there have the names a, of the list. There was a couple quarterbacks a couple of years ago that did it, four or five years ago, but I can't remember anybody this year that was a big name that's not attending. I think the the biggest thing is if you throw at the combine, you can help your performance if you run. If you end up doing really well there, your stock will go up. But if you do bad, it crushes you. But you could have a really good pro day and where the conditions are right and it'll kind of salvage it. So I I don't know. You got the Wonder Lick test and all that nonsense. So I mean there there's so much that goes into it. Yeah, I saw this year too, which I haven't noticed in the past. There's actually some head coaches not a, even attending the combine. I think Sean McVay was one of them. Well, they, like they don't have any draft four. picks. So. But I typically that your head coach goes, he wants to see every guy there. It's changed with the pro days and the individual interviews and all that sort of stuff. So you're right. The guy can only hurt himself by throwing at the combine. I remember the story with Keyshawn Johnson where the Giants wanted to sit him down for a psychological exam. And he's like, how long is it going to take? They said two hours. He's like, just take me off the board. (laughs) That's like Deion Deion Sanders. It was the Giants wanted to bring him in for a sit down. And they were asking him a couple different things. He said, what position you draft in? Tenth. Uh, Never mind. I ain't got time for y'all. I'm going to be gone by then. (laughs) You? I mean, I love the confidence, but anyway, we got the NFL combine all weekend long. So since we don't have spring training and baseball to enjoy right now, at least the NFL, as they continue their dominance on the calendar for the entire year, 
you got something to watch this weekend, but we'll go ahead and let you guys listen to our interview with Marcus Ogden and, uh, you know, get a little bit of insight on what life was like for him after the NFL. And he talks a little bit about how he ended up getting into the league because he missed the combine, but he had the, uh, the senior bowl or something like it. it was a different bowl. But anyway, enjoy the interview. It's next. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, joining me now is a man of many talents. Uh, some of you might remember him from his football days, whether uh, playing for Howard. So I'm definitely curious how he feels about the resurgence of these HBCUs all of a sudden. Uh, he does have a famous older brother. But we're not talking to him. We want to hear about life after football, too. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Ogden joins us tonight. Marcus, how's it going, brother? I'm doing well, Chad. How are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing I'm doing great, man. But I gotta ask, you know, the NFL Combine started tonight. At right now, what's your forty time like? Gosh, whoo! Probably like a five three if I'm lucky. Maybe <laughs> five two. Yeah, that's I don't know, man. I'm forty one, so that's gonna be pushing that. When I ran it at three uh, at three ten, I ran a four eight five. But you know, that was a long time ago. <laughs> hey, 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 you would think you know three ten four eight five just don't get in front of you, and, and there won't be a splat on the ground or anything, right? That, that's moving. <laughs> uh, man, hey, did you did you go to the combine or you just get pro days? Because I know you went to uh, Howard, right? I did. So I didn't go to the combine. I had my pro day. I went to the hula bowl in Maui, which was actually more important for me than the combine because I could do things at my school, but I wanted to be able to show the scouts I could play against top level talent, uh, you know, from division one football. So I played against guys from Florida state, Miami, Texas, North Carolina, uh, Notre Dame was in the game. Um, you know, uh, uh, Miami had, it was in the game. So my head coach was Mac Brown. Uh, he was at Texas at the time when he was my head coach. And then my old line coach was Jack Harbaugh, the father of Jim and John Harbaugh was my old line coach. Okay. So how, how different was that for you at the time going from playing at Howard and then all of a sudden, man, let's drop you in the mix with all these guys that have that NFL future in their, in their, uh, sights. It was it was great, man. I mean, you know, for me, by the time I got there, I had I knew I had a chance of being an NFL athlete. Didn't know if I was going to be drafted. If so, what round or be free agent. But I had convinced myself I had a phenomenal senior year trained with my strength coach who worked for Howard, who's actually still friends of mine to this day. And, you know, I put all the things and all the, you know, all of my effort in, maximum effort, had great effective strategy, and I was able to get maximum results to be driving to the National Football League in 2003. There you go. And, and you, you know, spent a good time in the league, played on a, a few different teams. And I, I'm just curious, mm -hmm. did you have a, a favorite spot that you were on? I, I see you connect with some of these Jaguar players out there, so I don't know if it's Jacksonville, is it Buffalo? Like, I don't know. Where, where did you feel most at home at? Uh, of course, with Baltimore because of my brother and playing with my brother, Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, Terrell Suggs. You know, when I retired from the NFL, I actually moved back to Baltimore. I had a house there. My family was from the Washington, D.C. area. So Baltimore for me was great from a fan perspective, playing with my brother. Everything was just, you know, fantastic in that regard. Yeah, man. And I'm going to get into some of that pro or uh, after the pro uh, career ended, because I know you got your hands in a few different things, but I did want to give you a quick shout out. Uh, you got a podcast going on that the Lev and Marcus show. And, you know, I was kind of mm -hmm. scrolling through there and, you know, I, I can't help but notice that the offensive lineman and you just can't go away. Cause I think your guest on the last week, uh, was, uh, Michael Strahan. So, I mean, how mm -hmm. did, you, did you face off with them a little bit? Did you ever get across from them on the field? I mean, how, how'd that go talking to uh, Strahan? Great question. No, I never played the giants in my career. So, but I was able to, you know, I'm, I'm an old lineman at heart. So having Michael on was great. He talked about his time in the NFL, you know, playing the game, you know, at Texas Southern, another HBCU, being drafted by the Giants and getting a chance to learn the game from Lawrence Taylor. And it was amazing to be able to have someone on the show of that caliber, of that credibility, because it only increases the credibility and the caliber of our show, trying to oh, get yeah. more guests and trying to get more people having, and also, of course, more sponsors to align with our brand. 
Michael was just an, an amazing guest. We had him for 30 minutes. He came on early. Like we were supposed to start at 10 o'clock. We started at 9.55 because he wanted to jump on early. He was excited about it. So we had about a nice 35 minutes with Michael on the podcast. And it was just great. Just lots of information uh, for athletes on how to transform and then transition talking about people who might be a little bit hesitant to pursue something because they're not, they might be a little bit fearful. And he was just great all around. Now, is he, is he larger than life when you're talking to him? Do you feel that? Because he's, he's made a career for himself beyond football, beyond what I think anybody probably imagined he would. Oh, sure. And, but again, you know, because he's brotherhood and because of the fact that, you know, he did my brother's voiceover for the top 100 players of all time, you know, I got a chance to feel like I kind of knew him and knew what he was about. With, and then he was exactly like he is on TV. Very funny, very outgoing, very energetic, very comical. So it was a really great interview uh, for about you know 35 minutes of his time. Awesome. Well, let, let's kind of transition into kind of what you've been up to lately and just to kind of help everybody get a backstory a little bit. So, you know, you played in the in the league for a while. You end up um, walking away and you started a, a business on your own. You got into construction and I think it was mostly uh, kind of around the Baltimore area, right? Correct. Yep. OK, so what, what made you get into that and, and how did that end up working out for you? You know, I got into it for the wrong reason, Chad, of chasing money and chasing big check syndrome. Uh, it worked out for me for a while. We had a lot of success. We got really lucky, had some great hires, got on some great project. And because we were minority certified, we were able to get a lot of opportunity when other people were not. But unfortunately, because of all that success, I wasn't prepared to handle it. And I have a saying, if you don't handle success, right, Chad, it will handle you. And it handled me. And I lost everything in my business, in my life, home, cars, everything, moved to Raleigh where I'm at currently. I had to file a chapter seven bankruptcy. I had to start completely over. And I ended up getting fired from two jobs in the same week. Took a job as a custodian working the night shift for eight twenty five an hour after an NFL career for almost six years after you know a, a multi million eight figure business. But then, as soon as I got fired from both those jobs, you know, and got into becoming a custodian, I had my spoiled milk moment of clarity, and that was the moment where someone's trashed and rotten meat and nasty protruding garbage got over my body and my skin and my clothes chat. And that was my wake up call. And that's when I said, I need to get my life on track and I need to get myself going. And that's when I launched the speaking business, took two and a half years, to get my first paid job, finally got my first paid job in April, 2016. And I've been doing it ever since on the last Oh gosh, almost six years. It'll be six years the next month. I got my first paid job. Um, you know, I've worked for we have worked for over 35 Fortune 500 brands as a speaker. Uh, and we're growing a really nice brand and we're really excited about what's coming in the future. Man, so I, I just want to kind of unpack some of that here for a second. So uh, you hit rock bottom essentially. And you know, we hear the stories yep. all the time, especially with NFL players. There was even a 30 for 30 called broke, right? And, and there's mm -hmm. guys that play a long time. And then when they walk away from the game, they don't have any money. And here you are, made a really successful transition to a business. It got away from you a little bit. And then, like you said, you find yourself at the depths that you could possibly be the deepest in. But yet you're able to bounce back. And I, I can tell just by the inflection in your voice, you seem like you really enjoy what you're doing now. So what mm -hmm. what what made you feel like you were called to be a motivational speaker? And and when you kind of envisioned that, what did that look like to you? What was the ultimate goal for that? So for me, Chad, I call myself an inspirational speaker because motivation to me is for the short term. And that's exactly what makes me different is I'm okay. inspirational to people with the knowledge, with the knowledge, with the action steps, with the information. And I got into this to help people succeed where I failed, but also to help people and especially my clients and anybody that I can, of course, not end up like I did with a chapter seven bankruptcy home foreclosed on. You know, I mean, for years I had to go through all the different processes and all that kind of stuff. So it was really, it was really hard. 
No, I mean, I can definitely appreciate that. And and from listening to some of the uh, results out there, I, I did some scouring on the internet and there was a lot of people who gave some really nice feedback after hearing from me because they could tell it was a real story and it kind of spoke to them. And, you know, it's it sometimes do as I say, not as I do. It is an inspirational thing because you actually took the pain for other people so they don't have to do that, hopefully, and they can learn from that. So that's awesome. That you're, that's awesome that you're in that. So if people want to book you or if anybody out there wants to find you for the inspirational uh, messaging, where, where would they get a hold of you at? They go to our website, www.marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N.com, or they can send us an email at marcus at marcusogden.com. Connect with us, reach out to us. We look forward to hearing from you. Awesome, man. Well, uh, outside of that, are, are you uh, still keeping up with the game? Are you still watching the NFL at all? I mean, is there, uh, I, you got this resurgence. I know you, we're up against a break here and we got to let you go, but I got to ask just real quick with all these HB uh, mm-hmm. colleges, they're taking off, they're, they're getting some swagger now. You got Dion doing his thing with Barstool. Like, how does that feel? Are you paying attention to that? Just what are your thoughts on the current game? Oh, I, I, I love it. I love it because it's exactly what should have been done years ago. All HBCUs needed it was just some notoriety and some TV time. The athletes are, you know, especially at the skill positions, they are really can be just as good a players at other schools. They really can be as long as there's the right weight room, the right strength coach, the right development. And, you know, it could be great. Now, O-line, D-line, it's a little bit different. You know, it just depends on, you know, the kids and their development. But they can't be as good as, you know, Division I athletes. There's not saying why they can't. But, again, the skill position, because it's all talent and ability to run, catch, run routes, stuff like that. You know, like the number one corner in uh, high school is going to Jackson State. I mean, why not? Why not be the number one corner and go learn from the best corner that ever played the game and then take that information, that knowledge, go play, you know, in some bowl games when you're ready to go graduate, show them what you can do against top tier talent. And if you're good enough, go get drafted. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. So all HBCs, all HBCUs need, in my opinion, a little bit of media coverage, a little bit of attention, a little bit more funding to, be able to provide what the athletes needed for their development. And I'm starting to see that now, and it's very exciting. Yeah, just a little bit of marketing. And you know what? If you're another coach, how are you going to try to out recruit Dion when they're trying to get a cornerback? You know, I mean, best of luck to you on that. Especially with nil now, athletes can make money at different schools. They don't, it's it's a new ball game now with nil and it leveled the playing field. You can go to a school, small town, and if they have big sponsors in there, you can make 50, 100 grand or a quarter million dollars as an athlete. And, you know, and still enjoy college and do what you got to do. So nil has really, in my opinion, leveled the playing field in that regard. Hey, they just need to make sure they take care of our big boys, the <laughs> offensive linemen, man. They don't get as many opportunities as the skilled players. So don't don't leave them out. But you know what? You you showed that you could come from the HBCU in the trenches. You made it to the league. So it's possible. So we know the skilled players are doing their thing. But you, you've helped pave the way on that stuff, too. We see it happen all the time. But, uh, man, Marcus, I know you got to run, brother. I appreciate Appreciate you jumping on and give me a few minutes and man, I hope we can connect down the road sometime. Maybe we can talk a little more. I love it. Chat. Well, yo, reach out to me on Facebook. We'll set something up, man. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. And everybody don't forget to check out the 11 Marcus show available anywhere you get your podcast. Marcus, have a good one, brother. Have a good one, chat. All right. It's been a few days. MLB is still stuck on the back burner. Mr. Brown, we haven't had a chance to to have you come on and at least share any of your thoughts. But from what I understand, they kind of met today for like 15 minutes for no purpose other than just to say they're not doing anything. I don't know. What the hell is happening now? Yeah, they had the deadline and obviously they didn't reach your uh, extended deadline uh, agreement. Too. Yeah. And then today, you haven't heard any news at all about meetings or anything. They met today. And they made zero progress on any front. I mean, is what, what I'm reading. There was like no purpose of it. It was just like, yeah, we're still a mile apart. So, yeah. I, I mean, what? Where do we go from here? Today was just another part of what the owners have planned from the beginning. In my opinion, it is collusion with the owners, right? Isn't that what this is? <laughs> yeah, because if they really wanted something done, they would have met in January. Oh, the Super Bowls this weekend. Gosh, we should probably get together and get something going. 
the players or December. aren't getting paid right now, so let's wait until the season starts and game checks are start rolling in and see if we can't get them to agree to something just so that they can get paid. And it's not, you know, like me and Mr. Brown were talking, it's not Max Scherzer or Bryce Harper who's worried about getting paid. It's, it's the guy who bounced back and forth from single A, I mean from triple A to the majors that really needs a check, and that's who your union represents, that bottom guy. So the last three years, I think I saw they have a 14% increase in revenue. Wouldn't surprise me. They're uh, making more money than they ever right. have. Right, and, and that's – And it's just about to go up again with their streaming <laughs> rights. Right, but yet we're only going to raise the salary, uh, minimum salary, like fifty grand. Yeah. Well, they've seen – Lowest in sports. So what I saw for the last four years where you just said the revenue has went up, but the average overall player salary has actually went down. Yeah, which everybody sees these mega deals and they, they don't think that, but it's yeah. the it's the way they work the system and the way they keep these players in that arbitration period and, and all that. It's just Baseball a Baseball just has some things. It's 2022. Let's get rid of the service time thing. I'm going to bring you up on opening day. I don't get to hold you back for a month. I don't get to control you for an extra year. I don't know. It just there's some things that ownership has that allows them to manipulate the players so much. If they really wanted a deal to be done, I feel like they would be in spring training right now. I feel like the only reason they're not there, of course, it's a lockout, so it's easy to say the owners, but it's the freaking owners. Well, it's not going to be a lockout very much longer, isn't it? A strike at a certain point, like. Because the players are the ones that are going to say they're not going to play. The owners are locking them out at the beginning, but doesn't it eventually become a strike? Because the if the owners are presenting proposals and the players, I don't know how does that work. It's still a lockout. It's still a lockout. Yeah. Is it stay a lockout? Uh, under my, that's what I thought. I thought. I, stay I don't know. Out. I was just asking. When we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, when Mr. Brown had his tooth out. He wasn't down here. We were looking it up. And the previous, I think, four times or five times there was a lockout, they had not missed an actual game of the regular season, which theoretically they could still play every game. So it's just different. This one has a much different tone than it has in previous lockouts. So what, what's up with Manfred coming out and doing these terrible press conferences, giggling oh, like my. a stupid ass? Man, how can you come out as a commissioner? Greg's the commissioner of every league we've ever done. You want to come out laughing when we're not playing? <laughs> are you laughing now because we can't do fantasy baseball? Is that what you're? Is that the type of commission you are? Yes, yeah, exactly how I am. Um, I'm, how do you come out with a straight face? Like, I mean, I mean, how, I mean, he well, didn't have a straight face. I mean, but like you're out there laughing and carrying on. But the fact is, is you know, you've done nothing to bring the sport forward. So it's like you should be embarrassed to even walk out there. Because, and I got it. He works for the owners. Right. I got it. But, like, at what point does he say, guys, I work for you, but I'm also the commissioner. we got to do what's best for the game. Right. And let's make some concessions. At what point does he stand in and be like, you know what? Let's concede this and give him this. And then let's focus on this. I mean, but, like, there's none of that going on. They're all standing firm. It's like. It's just going to be a stalemate. Just just dollars and cents perspective. I, I feel like if they gave the players every single thing they're asking for, it wouldn't hurt them at all. All right. I mean, they still be making money, more money than they could count. The, the only way it hurts them is that they lost all their negotiating power because they laid down to the union. But as far as like just frugally speaking, they could give the players every demand they want and everything would still be just fine. Yeah, it's not as though they're losing another piece of the pie. The pie just got a lot bigger or is getting a lot bigger. Hey, you know what I get pissed off about, though, is how many people do we see on social media? How many do you see in your baseball group? I'm tired of billionaires and millionaires fighting. Like, shut up. I mean, yeah. that that's the common rhetoric. I mean, that's, but, that's the lazy rhetoric is what it, it is. is. It is. I mean, you're forget about how much money they're making. Where do you want the money to go? And they're like, well, don't charge $14 for a beer. They're charging what the market dictates. You guys go to games and pay that amount, then that's what gets charged. And the whole thing is, though, like, do you just want the owners to keep all the money? I mean, is that that's what you're saying if you just don't want them to argue, right? Just let the owners keep keeping the money and players can just play the game because it's a kid's game. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, <laughs> the, one of the best things I saw, two things. So, you know, I make decent money in my profession, but – you know, I make what I make, and I, I don't make anywhere near the minimum salary of a Major League Baseball player. But guess what? No one's lining up to watch me move trucks down the road. Well, and you're going to do it for 30 years? 
Yeah, but my yeah, my point is though is that it's not entertaining. There's no uh demand for that. The revenue's not the same. No one's gonna want to watch us do that for a living. So my point is Yes, they play a kid's game, but like you said, people dictate supply and demand. Right. We show up, we pay the prices. Now, well, real quick, the reason why I said you're going to do it for 30 years is what's the average time people spend in the big leagues? Like four years. Yeah, probably. it's like four years. Right. So, okay, yeah, you made maybe $2 million there, but that was for four years. Now you got to go back to the regular world and figure out something well and that's if you made two million dollars if you're the 23rd guy on the roster and you play four years you might actually make a million depending on which state you're in taxes taxes, and all that so now all of a sudden you're 27 and what are you going to do with your life all you've done is baseball for your entire life right i I mean i'm sorry but in 2022 a million dollars ain't going to go that far for the rest of your life you could say well at least they have that money but that guy who now has to re- reconstruct his life his family is the guy that the union's fighting for like it or not right so so here, here's my thing my second thing i was getting to yeah so people want to say millionaires versus billionaires but I, i've historically always kind of leaned towards the owners uh given my background and whatnot and, but this time it's a lockout the owners are clearly dirty they did not operate in good faith. They wanted the season they to set be it delayed. Up. It was clearly, you know, just collusion to do that. But, Absolutely. So my point is, is that Jeff Passan had a great quote that said, you could bring out the, the next best 1,200 players to play the game. The game suffers tremendously. Right, with 1,200 replacement players. Oh, absolutely. But you bring in 30 new business owners, like business men with business acumen or women, and they control these teams. And there's some of them might even get better. Oh, yeah. So, like, make that make sense. I mean, the Marlins just tried Derek Jeter. His business acumen didn't work very well for their fire sales down there. So, yeah, let's get rid of some of these leaderships and, and get some people that can run a damn business. But you're not going to see that happen. Hell, look at the NFL. You can't get rid of owners there. And, you know, we got the Washington emails, and they still got that going on. So, it's just a mess. And, you know, we're, we're never going to get a salary cap. We're never going to get a salary floor. And it's going to be these little bickering points that are going to happen. The problem is if they don't recognize the trend in the revenues and agree on something, we need something that's going to last longer than four years. It needs to be something that's going to fix things for like the next decade or two. Yeah, it should be like a minimum eight-year agreement when they come to an agreement. Yeah, I Ten guess, year, a decade, because, I mean, a lot's going to change in that next decade, then renegotiate, not in four years. I, and that's why this I'll, is such a contentious thing. It's it's terrible. If you look at the CFP playoff and they're not going to expand and they have TV rights for that deal for a certain amount of time, that's why they're not. At, well, really, that's why they're not. Same thing with baseball. Where, where are your TV rights? MLB, TV, ESPN, streaming networks. Did you sign something until 2029? Okay, then that's how long the CBA goes to. I, I know I talked about it earlier in the week, but just last thing on this and we'll move on. Mr. Brown, did you see the revenue sheet the Atlanta Braves had last year? Because they're the only publicly traded there's, team. There's two. There's two. I don't remember who the other one is, but they're one of two, and they they made like five hundred million dollars. Is that what it so was? So the revenue was five hundred. Right? Their profit was a hundred and eight million. Yeah, like profit. Yeah, like they're done with bills. Yeah, and it's like oh, and basically what it equated to was their revenue was like six million dollars a home game, and they made a million dollars in profit right. every time they opened right. Truist Park. Well, you got to think two things: they're Liberty Mutual. They have many. Uh, areas in their business other than the Braves. So they're a business machine. Right. But also, had the Braves not took this deep step into the playoffs, where would they have been? Right. So I, I two things. The Braves traditionally have a good fan base. They they're they average thirty two K a year. They're they're top ten in attendance almost year in, year out. Maybe top five. Uh the the team's usually competitive and they're a very marketable team. We've talked about it before how they're kind of the Southeast, right? Right. But, man, wouldn't you love to see what the Dodgers books look like? Oh, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, like, what if what if you found out the Dodgers, despite them spending the money on payroll they did, made like $200 million? I, mean, I bet they did. They, they have to be making money. They wouldn't be putting it right, out Right. Right. They Dodgers. don't even care about the luxury tax. I'd love to see how much the Pirates owner made. I know. The Pirates would be fantastic. I was going to say, that would be the interesting one. Uh, so, maybe so, – Real quick, though. So – 
we had the pandemic, that 60 game season with the Dodgers, and Chad won fantasy. Woo! It didn't mean Asterix. nothing. I got then, the t shirt to prove it. And then last year, everybody bounced back. We had a kind of a normal season, and everyone's wanting normalcy. They just lifted the mask mandates all over the country. We want a normal baseball season from the beginning of opening day. And this is what they do they shit all over us. All we want is baseball. We want to be outside. We want spring, and they're letting us down, and that's what they did. All right, we are down in the home stretch when it comes to the NBA playoffs and the the winding down of the season, but big news because maybe the best player in the league comes back tonight as Kevin Durant is uh, taking the court as the Nets take the heat. My question to you guys is, right now the Nets are sitting in eighth, they're 32-31. and 31. Where do you think they reasonably might finish? And by the way, they're the only team I see that has a uh, better record on the road than they do at home. I wonder why. <laughs> Can't imagine why. <laughs> I think that uh, Katie comes back, stays healthy for the rest of the season, that they're going to end up either in a five or six spot in the East. How I many games they got left? They've got what about twenty games left? Or 32, uh, man, 31? you're gonna make me do math, you bastard. So thirty-two, thirty-one, they, sixty-three. They played, they played sixty-three games. They got nineteen games left. They got thirty-two and thirty-one. Cleveland's at thirty-six and twenty-six in the five. I think those four games are probably the most they can make up because Milwaukee, Chicago, Philly, Miami are the top four. I don't see them getting in there. I think the highest they get's five, and that's if they play lights out. They're, yeah, but they're, I, they're I, not I, in the tournament. I, I was getting ready to say six if I had to guess. Best case scenario I for think, me. I think they've been five and seventeen without Durant. That's pretty bad. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe Ben Simmons might decide to play this year. Maybe that'll help him. He's week to week. Dude, I saw this meme Monster today. I had to share it, and it was a Nets update of their roster. And it always gives like everybody out there doing something athletic, and it's got every guy on their team shooting except for Ben Simmons. He's throwing a pass. There's like eight now, of them saw, on the it poster. Was great. It was great. <laughs> That's great. So, my thing on Ben Simmons, you've been out all year long. You haven't been injured. You've just been disgruntled with Philly's oh, manager. No, they say he's injured. He's not injured. It's <laughs> bullshit. We know this. How are you not ready to play ball? Look, I, how are you not ready? I don't know. And, and like, if it, if it is mental uh, issues that he's having, uh, mental illness or whatever, like, maybe it is that bad. And if it is, and you're the Nets and you just traded for him, like, you can't be feeling good about this. I mean, you you figured he would be good to go. He, he's been working out and all this stuff, and every time people try to talk to him about it, he's just like, that's personal. I don't want to talk about any of that. So, like, this is just – it's nonsense at this point. So, I have a question for you on the other side of that. Philadelphia, James Harden's looking real good. Mesh and Maxie's playing lights out. They're three games back of the top seed, actually uh, two games back of Miami for the top seed in the East. Do you think they'll finish strong and end up with that one seed? The way it started? Yeah, probably. Uh, like, like, for them to gel that quickly, like, usually when this stuff happens, it takes – like, they, they're rolling yeah. with Harden. Well, the thing is, is Embiid's never had a player that would take all that pressure off of him. So, they've either got a double Harden or they've got a double Embiid. It's such and a compliment. The fact is, is the, the high-low going oh, yeah. on. So, to me, they're dangerous. And I know you and I talked about it last week, but uh, I think Philly finishes number one seed. I'm not saying they're going to go any further than Brooklyn in the East, but I feel like their matchup will be – They're only two games out. Right. I think how far they go in the playoffs depends if Maxi continues to be the player that he has been for He's the been most part. And the especially time. since these three got together, they're – well, they've got four games together so far. Yeah. They're averaging 85 between the three of them. Maxie's giving them like 24 games. Maxie's standing there with no more than 12 feet of it. Yep. Like, yeah, it's, it's, if he can continue to play. Yeah. I mean, it, it's crazy. And Harden's like back to, like, I'll do 30, 12, and 10. Like, no no big deal. And Embiid's still going to get his. Like, they are, I think they're the favorite it, to win it all right now. I, I don't know if I go that far, but I'll say Miami is a mirage at the top seed in the East. They keep winning. They're eight and two in their last. Miami is that great regular season team that loses in the opening round of the tournament because they played in a weak conference in college basketball. 
That's there, who they are. In the if NBA. you match up as the eight seed against Miami, you're not real worried about it. No. So potential teams that would play Miami right now would be Toronto, Brooklyn, Charlotte, Atlanta. You think that Atlanta, who's in the Eastern Conference Finals, Brooklyn, any of them are worried about playing Miami? Absolutely not. Yeah, like Atlanta could definitely pull. Even Charlotte, if they were healthy, could pose it. Yeah, if Jordan suits up. Yeah, if he, yeah, he <laughs> might. We saw him a couple <laughs> weeks ago looking like he was ready Challenge to play. Challenge of Magic 101. Uh, so, Biggie, do you think the Suns are the favorite to win it all? Uh, I actually like Golden State. You like Golden State? Okay. When Draymond comes back healthy, and if he stays healthy, they're the best team in basketball. You look at their record with and without Draymond. Without Draymond, they're like seven. They're uh, God, they're like fourteen games, twelve or fourteen games under five hundred without Draymond. You bring him back with the Splash Brothers. Wiseman's healthy. Wiggins was an All Star. They have depth. Pool. Uh, Gary Payton the second. I, I think that. The Warriors completely healthy should be the odds on. Are favorite. we going to get a Suns Warriors Western Conference Final? I'm really disappointed if we don't. I want to see that. Like, it seems like that's a lock, right? Unless old John Morant, who could win both Most Improved Player and MVP, <laughs> decides to throw a wrench at somebody. How, how is he Most Improved Player though? Like, don't get me wrong. Like, but he was good last year. He was, but he's up to scoring average by seven a game this year. He's improved his outside shooting. I don't have it in fantasy. He has games like the other night. He had two games Saturday and Monday. He went. 46. Monday, he went for 52. He was 22 of 30. You tried to trade Grayson Allen for him for me one time. No. Yes, that Not happened. Ja. That happened. Oh, huh. you should have accepted it. I did, and it got vetoed. No, he did do that. Yeah, you remember, right? I do. It was, it was like, why? I needed somebody <laughs> trip. That's what it was. I think you hated it. it. You must have got into the blue label instead of the yeah. beam. I don't yeah. know what happened. The, go- I, the I ghost is rare. I got sick on Southern <laughs> Host. $80 actually. shots. <laughs> Uh, the uh, Lakers are now on the uh, the bubble at the ninth seed, so they uh, are only two and a half games ahead of Portland, who is the eleventh uh, seed. Are the Here's Lakers going to make even the play in now? I think they're going to end up in the play in, but you end up in the play on play in. Minnesota is pretty good, thirty four twenty nine. You got the Clippers who have owned the Lakers this year, and the Pelicans who are actually play pretty good when everyone's healthy. I know Zion's out. You have this Lakers squad. They got Russ. You don't want him on the floor at the end of the game. Melo is old. I know he can still shoot it. AD has played uh, less than 40 games. He's played 37 games this year. He's probably not coming back in the regular season. LeBron, at the end of the year, might hit 62 games for his max out of 82. The two guys on their team that are going to have played the most games are Westbrook, who you don't want on the floor at the end of the game, and Melo. Like, you're going out there rolling with Monk and hoping Austin Reeves shows up and plays well. Now, I'm not a LeBron uh, fan. Guess what? Dude, give him credit. He's the only reason they're ninth. Guess what, though? They're not making the play-in. You don't think so? You think that uh, Portland or San Antonio, who are only each a couple games back? I'm, so, I'm calling it right now. All right. There, there's no way. That, I mean, have you seen how disastrous the Lakers But LeBron have been? activated playoff mode earlier this year. No, he can't take over a game like he used to. But and, he activated and, and last playoff time, mode what, on Twitter. What happened last time he, uh, he came out and said he activated playoff mode? They blew a nut and they missed the playoffs? Exactly. So, dude, you know I, thanks the for thing confirming about- my uh, observation. Hey, so real quick, though, and I hate LeBron like the best of us, but <laughs> did you see that? In eight, his 19th season, how big of the discrepancy is with his points per game all time. So you have Kareem in his 19th season, averaged 14 a game, which is the highest of all time. LeBron is averaging, I think, 29 a game. Yeah, he's 28, 29. He's scoring oh, yeah. a clip this so year. He's, he's beating that clip by 15 points a game in his 19th season in the NBA. Does it, Here's the does thing. it matter for wins, though? No, uh, I'm just – it's freaking amazing. It's, it's impressive. but it's, it's, it's amazing, but don't go off a 19th year in the league. That's what LeBron stands do because go off of his age. What was Kareem doing when he was 37? Well, but you can make college. the argument for all the know, mileage and the playoffs. the stats around like that. What he's doing is amazing. I, I, I completely agree with you. I just get mad when they're like – every LeBron stat is flipped to – uh, at age 33 or age 35 or year 27, um, what he's doing is crazy good. It was funny, though, because Tim Duncan was on the list, and he averaged like eight points a game, but he was four years older. Yes. He, he right, was a four-year right, right. graduate at Wake Forest. Yep. Correct. 
Yeah, so, so it's that just is like funny. when they they compare Jordan and LeBron, and they talk about LeBron now having more points on less shots, and I'm like, okay, uh, look at how many three pointers he shot. Like it's not well, an apples it, to apples it, comparison. And, and, and again, you have different training and science and things like yeah. that that are backed behind this. We have load management. LeBron, like whether you love or hate this aspect of the game, his load management takes place while he's on the court. Like oh, he, absolutely. He can play in a game and exert zero energy. Right. And, you know. At least on one side of the ball. I mean, he's got to do something because he's got a blemish on his career that he's got to remove because he made Space Jam 2, and, and that's going to be his legacy. Oh, bullshit. It's so bad. Ugh. It's so bad. Did you see? I love the fact that Cleveland was like, you know, I know you said he told me he might want to come here, but we, we're not so sure we want him now. So we're, we're going in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we're all right. Uh, speaking of uh, legacies winding down, uh, we have a big event coming up Saturday that I, I, I'll be at work, but hopefully you guys get to enjoy it. And I know Biggie's looking forward to uh, Saturday, and I think it's got a pretty penny on the ticket price, but Coach K's last game at Cameron Indoor. And who's the opponent, Biggie? UNC. Not a better team to finish against. So, the Tar Heels. What is – Coach K's legacy to you, and can you spell his last name? Cannot spell his last name. I can barely pronounce it. I saw the tickets for Saturday were going north of five thousand dollars. So it's like Super Bowl territory. The average yes. price is fifty four hundred. The average? <sighs> yes, I read that today. <sighs> and what's that place hold? Like eighteen people? It's a small building. Yeah, it is pretty. It is pretty small. They would camp outside. They call it uh, Krzyzewskiville. You're right. You can't say the last name very well. (laughs) No, I put that on the page or on the group today. Uh, To me, Coach K is the greatest coach in the history of basketball. Period. In college basketball. I say period. And it's not even close. I know there's some who say uh, John Wooden. To me, it's not close. It's different eras. What he did with the changing landscape, especially the last 20 years. And then you want to say, okay, let's compare him to professionals like Phil Jackson, Pat Riley, Greg Popovich. If you don't have him on the Mount Rushmore, then you just don't know basketball. No, nah, he is an absolute legend. Uh, he's Look at what he did with Team USA. I, I, that's what I'm saying. Let's yeah. go back a step further, though. On the original Dream Team, it was Chuck Daly's team, but Coach K was an assistant, right? In 92, Way back when. Yeah, 92, 92. Coach K was an assistant because he was that damn good. And it was coached by bad boys coach Chuck Daly. But we want Coach K on our staff. Yeah. And he's still freaking coaching. Chuck Daly's dead. Yeah. Coach K is still coaching. He's Dude, still balling uh, out. He's still dying his hair. Yeah, he looks the exact same. <laughs> he looks like a gray hair in his noggin. Coach K has been at Duke longer than any of us have been alive. Dude. Damn. Absolute legend. Like, to me, there wasn't a better guy when we have that downfall there for a minute on USA basketball, right? Oh, you know? yeah. And they're like, well, Coach K's taking it over. I was like, what a perfect guy to take yeah, over the program. He's going to resurrect it. Like, there could have been no better player because he was that type of personality that's like, you know what? I'm a badass at the college level, but guess what? I can still mess with you pros, and you're going to listen to me. And, then, yeah. and we're talking about guys like Kobe, right? Yeah, but like he had when he walks into a gym to coach USA basketball, the pros even stop. Like you know, they're not going to give Coach K shit. No, I mean, do you agree? Absolutely. And, and and you look at even now, like when he's when has he not been relevant? The only time in my entire life. I just think of Duke not being good was those Cherokee Parks years, and that was when he had the back surgery and he yep. missed like a season. Yeah, and- he took almost an entire year off, 95, 96. They had like a two-year span where they weren't relevant as far as the top ten national pitcher goes, and that's the only time other than when he first got started. Yeah. And even when he first got started, it only took him about his third, fourth year to turn a program that wasn't a national power into a team that was going to the Final Four. He had uh, Jay Bills, Johnny Dawkins. That was a good team, 85, 86, I think it was. Somewhere in there they went to the Final Four. And, hell, four. what's his coaching tree look like? He got uh, Johnny Dawkins, Tommy Amaker, who doesn't get to take over, John Shire. Uh, <laughs> Is that why he's retired? Jeff Capel, uh, Bobby Hurley. He's got guys out there everywhere. And that's the other thing, too. I know they were kind of making a lot about – him stepping down and Shire taking over and Amaker really wanted the job. Amaker hasn't been there in like 20 years. Shire's been on your bench the last 12, 13 seasons. He does all your recruiting. Why wouldn't you want him to be the guy that succeeds you? Succeeds you. 
And the other thing they said was that uh, Coach K doesn't do a whole lot outside of basketball. He's not a big golfer. So even though he's leaving the bench, he's still going to stay involved with the program. Dude, you know his record in the NIT is only two and two. That's pretty impressive because <laughs> he's only been in the NIT a couple times. Yep. That's hilarious. Uh, his uh, overall coaching record, he's won uh, probably by the time the season's over, he'll probably have won 1,200 games. He's got 1,196 wins, only 365 losses. He's got a 766 winning percentage. That's amazing. At the highest level that you can do it. And there's other guys out there like a Kelly Perry, a Patino. Uh, Bobby Knight, all through your years, there's been other elite coaches who get top in talent. Jerry Tarkarian down at UNLV, running Rebels, went undefeated, won a national title. You've outlasted all those guys to win 75% of your games and five national titles. But, like, are we – so, you know, he hasn't won a coach of the year since 99. Well, he falls in that category that Bill Belichick does where you're so good – there, there's more on you if you fall back a little and you're not a top 10 team than like a year like this where people are getting on them because they had lost four games. Yeah. They lost four games by to go under five points. It was, or yeah. lost three games. They're giving these awards to like the Bruce Pearls of the world. Right. He's going around to different programs and resurrecting them, whereas <laughs> Coach K just a str- stranglehold on the Duke franchise. It's like you set the bar so high for yourself unless oh, you it's win just a Duke. national That's title. what you do. Yeah. So – if you got like a the dude uh, Scott was it Scott Drew at Baylor? Yeah, he would be yep. coach of the year. You got like a Bruce Pearl. Those guys are going Mark to get those Fugh. awards over people that's like Coach K who is expected to do it. Yeah, like Coach K is, is so high in the stratosphere, like he can't even hit his own expectations. Right. It's but and it's it's crazy. But here's the question I got for you guys: Is Duke basketball going to just be? And also ran after he's gone. So what's the Coach K effect really? Is it just why he's there? He was able to keep that legacy and control it and have them be the most dominant force in college basketball over the last 40 years? Or is it the program and they're still going to just keep being Duke without him? So I don't remember his name, but apparently the assistant that's taken over is like John his num- number one guy. And the guy people I've talked to says they're going to continue along. The one thing that popped in my head, though, how long was Jim Calhoun and UConn like a factor? Right. And then as soon as he left, they fell apart. Yep. So, but I don't, they did win a title with Kevin Al- Ollie, but then, but they were right. so up and yeah, down. I feel like this scenario, I can't. Obviously, you can't say he's going to reach Coach Cal or Coach K's uh, stratosphere, but I feel like they couldn't put it in the better hands of a guy who's right there in the umbrella. It keeps the culture. I absolutely love the hire because they didn't go outside the program. It's a guy who's been tied there. And here's the biggest thing as you get older, Coach K, we can all say he looks the same. Shire is the lead guy for all their recruiting. Coach K comes in and closes the deal. They got two guys that will be top five picks this year. They're bringing in continuity with the program. K is going to leave, but he's still going to have kind of a overall hand within the program. UNC, when Dean Smith retired – they had a little bit of law before they got Roy Williams and got back to prominence. I think that Duke has their Roy Williams and John Shire. I so know that it's just going to roll along like a well-oiled machine. Jeremy Glazer's a good friend of mine, huge Duke fan. He's our age, lives and dies Duke basketball. As soon as Kay announced he was going to retire before they announced it, he said Shire will be the next coach. It'll be the best thing that could have happened. We're going to keep rolling. So I would take his word for it and think that they got the right guy and that they stay atop. 8, 10, 12 team year after year. The comparison I just want to bring up real quick. So you talked about Roy Williams going to North Carolina. So the coach at Kansas now, Bill Self. Yeah. Bill Self has had a hell of a run. Uh, absolutely. So I, I say Coach K is going to probably end around 1,200 wins, right? Bill Self is, is currently um, at 752 wins. How old is he? Uh, Bill Self is – 56. I don't know. He Isn't was born Coach in K like seventy. Well, he was yeah. born. He's seventy-five. Bill Self was born in sixty-two, so he is. Uh, he'll be 60. 60 this year. Yeah, um, he's his, got some years. Oh, you know, Coach K and Vince McMahon are the same age. There you go. And right, one sorry. of them, maybe both, will be in WrestleMania <laughs> by the time it's done. 
But uh, Bill Self's winning percentage, I just think this is crazy. It's almost the same. He's 767 at Kansas. You know what, though? Speaking of WrestleMania or uh, wrestling, you could have Coach K be like uh, Vince's uh, manager. And he kind of looks like Paul Bear, just not fat with that same jet black hair. <laughs> <laughs> he could be. He just needs to stand there and just shout you know, at the <laughs> officials. It'd be well, great. <laughs> well, well, well. Sorry. We're just I, I, I saw ruining this. the legacy of Coach K by comparing him to Paul Bear. I just Paul saw Bear the same great. jet black hair, just about 200 pounds lighter. Uh, so if you had to uh, – Say yes or no, will Bill Self get close to the 1,200? I don't think he will. I think it will be too hard to sustain that long. And, my God, the Big 12 is such a good conference. But it's about to change. So well, maybe I mean, it gets easier for him. But I think it gets easier. A- so when, when Coach Cade leaves, who do you think is the most efficient college basketball head coach? So that's, where I, that's why I was bringing self? it up. That, I think it's Bill Self. Yeah, I think it's Self, hands down. Because I, I'd like to say Calipari, but Calipari will have years where his guys all leave for the draft and he dips right. big time. Kansas just keeps doing it. Kansas thing. produces like a top 10 pick, right, and their right, guys right. are all good, but they're never down. I mean, how many years in a row did they win the Big 12? Or have they won? Big and I agree, like, but like, like if they even slip down to like 15 in the rankings for even during the season, you're like, man, it's a down year. For yeah, yeah. Yep. but you're still scared of them. Yeah. And, and you sure as hell don't want to go to the fog. You, you know, know what I'd like to see? How many wins Mark Few got at Gonzaga? Yeah, they win 30 I mean, every year. he's going to keep winning thirty games because the only challenge he gets is maybe St. Mary's. Yeah, every you, now you and can't then. you can't compare that to but Bill Self. Just purely for wins is why I'm yeah. right. Their, their preseason schedule or their pre-conference schedule, they'll play the big schools, and after that, like Chad said, at St. Mary's. Keith, My only question is, do they let Stockton back in now? Uh, oh, no, that, that's severed, man. Even even without the mask stuff now, I think that damage is done. They said that it was a relationship we could build back in the future. The only thing I got about the whole thing was, you don't want to wear a mask, that's fine. But don't tell me athletes are dying dead on the floor. I would notice that. Well, he's yeah. not an athlete anymore. Oh, he's retard. Okay. Uh, so, Mark, well, you, how many wins does retard. he have? Uh, Mark Few is 654 and 128. He's got an 836 winning percentage. How old is he? Um, he was born, same age, 62. Okay, so he's not going to get – I was just curious because he's wanted such a high clip for a long time. So Bill Self takes over as the predominant man amongst men. I, I, I think coaching. so. But, man, you think about, like, what a time this is because, like, Bayheim's not got – Roy Williams just left. Yep. Uh, Bayheim has announced that uh, they didn't give a name, but they do have a successor – But succession plan. You know, he's only there because his grandson, I think. Is he still – Well, he's got – no, That's his kid. Or, that's right. It is his he kid. He's got two kids he's, on his team. He's well, gets his son. <laughs> he's got two kids on his team. Well, that what play. are they? I mean, are they freshmen? One's – Buddy Bayheim, I think, is a junior. Buddy he's Bayheim. good. He what a freaking it. name. Yeah, he's a shooting guard. So man. he's staying until they're done. Yes. These kids. Jim they Bayheim get, looks like he's 75 years old. They get free he's tuition because he works there. <laughs> he's been at Syracuse <laughs> wow. since the early 50s, although his wife just got pulled up at gunpoint. <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, early 70s. I'm sorry. He's been no, there for I go 50 with 50s. Years. I buy that. So who else <laughs> plays that defense like he does? I hate that defense. It's like the, the zone defense is so classic. As soon as they get in tournament time, that's the only thing people can say is like, it's that 2 3 Syracuse zone. Like, my God, I've never seen this before in any gym in America. Exactly. Like, that was the basic defense in like middle school. They're like, they play teach two, you three. youth ball when you're play eight two, three. Yeah. But uh, they just do it better than anybody else, I guess. But uh, the so who else? I mean, Mark Few's going to be on that list, but he's still here for a you while. You know, a guy I think has a chance to kind of get into that, especially in the ACC with some of these guys leaving. They won a national title a couple of years ago, Tony Bennett. at uh, Yeah, Tony Virginia. Bennett's got a legacy going there. And his dad was a uh, coach forever at Wisconsin. Great recruit yeah. coming in. Yeah, <laughs> shout yeah, out. baby. Well, and then, you know, we'll say Huggins has probably only got a couple of years left. You know, if so he there's coaches another guy. more than two more years, I'd be surprised. He'll coach next year to get fixed. What, yeah, he doesn't want to go out on the note this year. But, but like, if they're a sweet 16 next, team next year, I think he probably just leaves that. Maybe. I mean, it, it's I hard would. to tell with them. I would. It's hard to tell with them. But, you know, there's these names in college basketball that are just uh, about to go bye-bye, you know, yeah. and it's, it's crazy. Because they, they're like uh, our whole lives – We've associated that with them. Then you have names of guys who just really don't get appreciated, like Leonard Hamilton down at Florida State. 
what he's done there, and as long as he's been there, he's like an institution, and they're usually a pretty good team. So th- just to kind of bring this conversation to an end, I'm excited because friend of the show, uh, Bob Picozzi, who is a March Madness freak, he doesn't even fill out a bracket because he's too invested in just the quality of the games. Like he doesn't want to have a rooting interest. He just wants to enjoy it. And, uh, you know, we've had him the past couple marches and he's going to sneak in a little bit of time for us uh, here in about a week and a half. And, you know, I was trying to get him after the brackets come out, but you can't disturb him during the game so it can't be a night when it's the first four or it's the first round of the tournament and it can't be on a sunday because that's conference uh championship week and all that stuff so we're gonna get them on like a tuesday afternoon and just uh kind of roll through it but you know i'm i'm curious to hear his thoughts on coach k and just you know how excited it is to be back for march madness with fans and everybody and this is it's man it's the best time in sports because we don't have uh, well, it's not the best time in sports, but we don't have baseball and things like that going on. So March Madness, for me particularly, is going to weigh pretty heavy this year. How about you call off the first weekend and let's all go watch it somewhere? Well, I mean, you're talking about a Thursday and a Friday? The the first... Uh, well, two weeks from today is the best day. I used to try and act like I was sick so I didn't have to go to school. That's when you schedule your vasectomies. Right. So... Two weeks from today and tomorrow, the two best days. So we'll be watching the we'll be watching a lot of the games on our show in two weeks. Oh yeah. Well, I'll probably be I'll, I'll be out of town that week. There you go. Ah, you bastard! Well, you better call in, Dad. I need to. You need to get your vasectomy reversed. I do. I want to have more kids. <laughs> snip, snap, snip, snap. I want more kids. Just <laughs> get COVID. I want to bring joy to the world. That's get right. COVID that week. I don't know if that's always joy, but you can bring something. Joy. <laughs> joy uh, Taylor with the news. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I love some Joy Taylor. Mm. Easy now. Mm. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we almost got uh, another show in the books here. So just put a nice little bow on it here. One of the questions we put out there to the masses was rank these titles uh, just in order of appearance. You know, how you feel about trophies and the, the four that we put up there. And if you guys want to throw anything else in here, you can. But I'll be honest with you, we're just – you know, talking about March Madness and whatnot, like all they get is that plaque, and it's kind of blah. Like I, I didn't want to include that, but I did put the C, uh, college football uh, playoff trophy in there, Lord Stanley's Cup, the Commissioner's Trophy for baseball, the O'Brien Trophy, and then the Lombardi Trophy. So There's five. Yeah. So what's the fifth one? You said five, didn't you? One, two, three, four. Yeah, I just CFB said them. All. Yeah, yeah with that's four majors. All right, my bad. Four major sports and then college football, and there's the extra. To me, there's one trophy that's the trophy of all trophies. It's not my favorite sport, but Lord Stanley's Cup. You drink beer out of it. You can do keg stands with it. <laughs> you can there, baptize your children. Like it. Your name gets etched into it. Now, it's not obviously my favorite sport. I do like uh, the Lombardi, so it's symbolic, MLB with all the flags. But to me, the trophy of all trophies is Lord Stanley's Cup. And then the fact that they give it to each player and you get to have it for a day, I just love that. I, I'm with you. It's number one. Number two. And I see a lot of people divided on these. I would put the commissioner's trophy because to me, there's something about having the pennants, you know, represent all that. Like it's cool. It's like the whole league is on the trophy essentially. So I really like that aspect of it. I I think the CFP and the O'Brien trophy suck. I don't like the O'Brien trophy. I I don't know why. The CFP is definitely in my rankings. I had the CFP last and the O'Brien fourth. I mean, the CFP trophy looks like something you might win for, like, being salesman of the year or something yep. for, like, you know, Geico. Yeah, it's like best in your region. <laughs> right. It's a Dundee. <laughs> I mean, now, nah, Mr. Brown, are you biased on the baseball one? I mean, like, I didn't really look at it just based on the trophy itself. Um, so, I did go the World Series, and then I went Super Bowl, the Lombardi, and then I went Stanley Cup. After that was, let me see what I went. I went college football, and then I went NBA Finals. So you had that one last? Yeah. Okay, why? NBA Finals? Yeah. I think because I hate the NBA right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's enough explanation right there. But I feel like it's one of those things you get out of those quarter machines when we were kids, like the little NFL helmets. That's yeah. where you get the NBA trophy. Like it's uh, The thing where the bottom of it's like the net – and then I guess the bottom is the very bottom is supposed to be like the hardwood. I guess I don't know, man. It's just 
it's if like you have to try to explain the trophy, it's a bad trophy. Right. Like, I, I don't have to explain the baseball trophy or the NFL trophy. or and The thing about the Stanley Cup, though, I'll learn this, too, is every 13 years they replace one of the rungs in it because you – They have to add more teams. Yeah, they keep just adding the – because I guess it's been around since 1898 or some yep. nonsense like that. So, they just take and put it in the Hall of Fame. I mean, when you when you talk about it, just I guess I read it wrong. If you're just talking about just the trophy itself, it, clearly it's a Stanley Cup because it's just so much more tradition there. And like, if you're drinking beer out of it, consider me a, a fan. I I mean, you can drink whatever you could. Sure. Kevin Durant could join the NHL and drink Scarlett Johansson's bathwater out of it for a day. Mm. And the, the coolest thing about it, other than uh, drinking bathwater, is that each player gets to, for a day. You want to drive around with the top down and it rides shotgun? You do. I just, like it, like you said, just the pure trophy in it, it's a trophy's trophy. Mm. And if a trophy wife had a trophy wife, it would have a Lord stand. <laughs> and yet none of us really watch hockey, so we just enjoy the, the trophy hey, for what it's Playoff like. hockey, I'll watch. Beards uh, and fights, baby. All right, we're going to wrap up next week, guys. We got a, a guy named Phil Barth that's joining us. He's a big-time Cleveland sports fanatic, and uh, he's done a lot of coverage. And I'm really like, – without baseball, we don't have too much to talk about, but I really want to get in the mind of somebody about the change from the Indians to the Guardians and, and some things around just what's happened with that. Roller derby. Yeah, I mean, there's – you know. <laughs> Don't mess with the roller derby. You ever see that uh, one roller derby movie with like LL Cool J in it? You know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. I haven't seen it. Ah, it's so bad. So, but like talking about that, we were talking off the air that we're hoping baseball's back by June 10th because we're going to Lake Erie and we we're planning on going to Detroit. And we're like, well, we can go to the Cleveland game, which is the first season of the Guardians, in quotations. I, I, is that a historic event? Is that no, what we're No, it's not. <laughs> but the fact is, we're like, yeah, I want to go to Detroit. And, like, whoever says that, I guess because when your options are Detroit and Cleveland, you're going to say Detroit, Detroit every Rock time. Rock City, baby. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, but we want to go to Detroit and see the Ty Cobb statue and everything else that involves. Mm, we'll drive through his hometown on the way. Or no, that was Cy Young. Never mind. It'll be all right. It's all right. We'll find all kinds of roadside attractions. That's a, a good point to end. Guys, it's been fun. Look forward to next week. This has been the We Don't Know Sports Podcast. Thanks for letting this invade your ears even just for a minute. Have a wonderful, fantastic weekend. Enjoy some conference basketball tournaments as we roll through that as we continue the the drive to March Madness. Have a good one, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.